Father, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation that I might know you. Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I might see your God, your purpose in my life. And I will fulfill that purpose in this generation. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to turn with me to back to John chapter 8. Two verses we are looking at it. Wherever Jesus went, along with the crowds, there was one set of people who always followed him. Those were his enemies. His adversaries always followed him wherever he went. They were looking to trip him. They were looking for a chance to kill him. And God through his apostle Peter talks about an adversary we all have. An adversary. Who is that? Satan. We have an adversary who is always following us. Looking for a time and a place to trip us, to finish us off. So when Jesus is preaching the truth, he's talking to them the words of life. In verse 40, he says, But you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. He says, you seek to kill me. If Jesus is saying that, it is true. He says, I'm a man who is trying to tell you the truth, the truth that can set you free. But you know what? You are seeking to kill me. And verse 58. And Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What does verse 59 say? Before Abraham was, I am. And then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Can you actually believe this? This is written in scripture. He is speaking to the people. And do you want to know who is this crowd? Who are there in this crowd? And tell us about this crowd. Verse 31, John 8, verse 31. What does it say? Then Jesus said to those who, to those Jews who believe him. This is the crowd who is picking up stones. The people who confess with their mouths, but who do not allow the truth to be applied in their hearts. And when Jesus is talking to them, they are stoning Getting ready to stone the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Life. We need to realize, often we are in that crowd. And he speaks to us who believe. But when we hear the words of life, we want to stone that very word that could give us life. We don't like that word. And Jesus just walks away. He just walks away from his adversaries, from his enemies. He just walks away. And God is asking us, are you there in that crowd? And I have this presumption that some of the stones they picked were left there by the crowd who had earlier come with stones to stone that woman. The stones they had dropped, which with they came to stone a confirmed sinner, now they are picking up probably the same stones to confirm, to stone the Son of God. That's why we, I say we need to keep checking our heart always of God because the heart is deceitful above all things. We can profess, confess, believe outwardly in Jesus. But what matters is Jesus says, you are not willing to accept the real truth. When I tell you the truth, why do you want to kill me? When I tell you the truth that before Abraham I am, why do they pick up stones to stone him? But what does Jesus do? That's not the point of the message today. What does Jesus do when he is confronted by his adversaries, by his enemies? What does scripture say? He hid himself and he went out. What did he do? He hid himself and he went away. Now this is different. This is interesting. Because in the Old Testament, when Elijah was confronted by his enemies, he called on fire from heaven. 
When Elisha was mocked by some children, he called a bear out of the forest. But the God who answered both Elijah's and Elisha's prayer just walks away. He just walks away. He hides himself and he walks away. He's telling us something. The covenant has changed. There is a paradigm shift in how you deal with your adversary. Because you and I do not fight flesh and blood. We do not fight flesh and we have no physical human enemies. We have only an enemy in the spirit and his name is Satan. So today, I want the light of God's word to show us the purpose of adversaries in our life and how to deal with them. Did you know that there is all, is there anybody who is so holy that we have no enemies here? No adversaries? Anybody here? If you can, then I will move aside and you can preach to us, to me also, because I would like to see you. Because even Jesus had enemies. Paul said, wherever I go, I only find enemies first. Then only the friends come trickling. No? So here God is saying, enemies are there for a purpose. And we need to learn how to deal with our enemies. So today I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel. We will look at verse 1 onwards. Chapter 1 and verse 1 onwards. Now there was a certain man of... Ramathem, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zub, and the, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her Boom. So there is an adversary over there. There is a rival, there is an adversary. So you need to, you need to look into this portion deeply and say, Lord, what are you trying to tell me this morning? One man with two wives. One is very successful in the eyes of the world. The other is a failure. The successful one has many children. Okay. In those days, you count your success the number of children, especially the number of sons you had. So one is very successful, the other is a failure. You want to translate that into your situation, don't make it into number of children, but look into how you are faring in your life. Are you successful or do you think you are a failure? At your workplace, at home, wherever. Some people look very outwardly successful, the other people look outwardly a failure. And their names are interesting. Penina is the name of the successful. Outwardly, she is very, very successful. Therefore, her name is Penina. Penina means pearl. It name means pearl. You know, everybody notices a pearl. And she is very, very successful. And her name is pearl. She is appreciated. She is prospering. And seemingly without any effort. Poor Hanna is waiting for a child. No child. Penina is delivering year after year after year. She is only delivering. You remember our role, Prime Minister of Pakistan, the one who was assassinated? The President of the Pakistan People's Party, PPAP? Then I said, Buddha, you know how many children she had? Every year in office she was delivering, delivering, delivering. So finally they named her permanently pregnant Prime Minister. <laughs> they should, that's why she heads that party. And some people are like that, like Perina. Fruitful, outwardly very, very successful. But God is not there in their success. Because in their heart they have rejected the living God. On the other side there is Hanna. Outwardly not very precious. Not valued. Not successful. But there is a purpose in her life. And her name means favor. Can be a pearl or you can be favored of God. If you are favored of God, you will fulfill God's destiny. You can be a pearl and never fulfill anything of God in your life. 
So there is this penance in life, very successful, they seem to be doing great in their work everywhere. They are very, very successful. And then there are these annas. And it's interesting about this family. This is a time when, as the book of Judges says, every man did what they pleased. There is no order, there is no law, there is no king. Israel has lots of enemies. Yet this family is very zealous for God. And many of us need to learn from this zeal and this determination of this family to be able to go and worship God when the nation is in pits. Today we talk about the state of the church. The church is so bad, so bad all over the world. Heresy falling away. But does that stop you from worshipping God? Does the state of the church determine your worship? Here it says they went every year to Shiloh. And who is the priest? Now, if you and I were in their place and you knew Hopni and Phineas were the priests, you wouldn't go anywhere to Shiloh. You wouldn't go anywhere near to Shiloh because you need to realize about Hopni and Phineas, what kind of priesthood they represent. This is, this is where the priesthood in Israel has reached rock bottom. But the priesthood shouldn't determine your worship. And if there are visitors here from other churches, let me tell you. The state of the sermon that you hear in your church or the state of the worship in your church, even if it is cold, should not determine your worship. People feel, oh, I can't do anything in my church. It's so boring. It's so dry. But why should that stop you from worshipping? Because it didn't stop this family from worshipping God. They still went to Shiloh. They still went regularly to Shiloh. Especially Hannah. I can understand Penina going every year to Shiloh to worship because she can say, Ah, oh God, I have a reason to go to Shiloh to thank you. What about Hannah? She's got no reason to go to Shiloh. She should be sulking and sitting at home and I don't want to go to church. I've been praying for years and years and years and years. You don't hear me. You don't answer my prayers. And on top of that, you are adding insult upon injury. Look at the other one. I cry, no answer. She doesn't even have to cry. Her prayers are all answered. I'm not going to Shiloh. Does it say so? It doesn't say so. It says that she kept on going. And I keep urging you to keep on going to worship this God. Because he told Abraham, I am your great reward. And here is Hannah going over and over to Shiloh to worship God. The second point you need to look is that in the flesh, Hannah should have been satisfied. Okay, so what if I have no children? I am my husband's favorite baby. Isn't that what it says? <laughs> What does it say? To Hannah, he would give a double portion. For he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. He says, it's okay, I'm happy. My husband loves me. Because most women have this problem, my husband doesn't love me. She says, I have no such problem. My husband loves me. And not only that, he gives me double that of my adversary. But was she satisfied with that? Was she satisfied with that? She was not. Why? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6 to 8. The voice said, cry out, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. Hannah knew a secret. She decided, I am not going to find my satisfaction in grass, in my man. He's after all grass. Today, a lot of young people try to find satisfaction in grass. You know what grass means. <laughs> they reach a high, and a little later, they come to a low. And Hannah said, my man is very good. He's very loving, he's very kind, he gives me a double portion, but God's word still says he is grass. And I'm not going to be satisfied with that because I'm looking for something more than that that will stand in my name forever. And if you look at Hannah's story, Hannah's story is full of tears. It's full of tears. Go back, you will see it's full of tears. To verse 7. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. And you would think that people won't provoke somebody else in the house of God. But even in the house of God people provoke. That's what's written. When did Penina provoke Hanna? Not only at home, but also at Shiloh. Maybe they went traveled, they went to Shiloh, they stayed for a couple of weeks over there and then... 
when it is time to leave suddenly penina wakes up in the morning and she has got morning sickness in shilo itself and she tells hanna you see i can see you again what are you good for nothing what's the point of eating the double portion i am able to conceive with a single portion she is provoking there right there in the house of god we need to realize we need to look things are hidden there in scripture and god is asking us do we do that do we provoke others in the house of god just because we are blessed and they are not and she wept and she is crying now let me tell you something do you know something that pain is not always your enemy do you know that how many of you like pain do you like pain here oh, praise god there is one honest man here he says i like pain you need to like pain can you imagine having a heart attack without any symptom you know what if heart attack did not proceed with pain all of them would be dead do you remember that tiny little thing inside you called appendix what if it burst without any pain you realize if you start looking at it the way god looks at it pain is a very good thing pain is a very good thing pain wants us to greater dangers that's lying ahead the pain is a sign of a deeper malaise of a deeper sickness you did not then deal with the pain you dealt with the problem that was causing the pain so when your stomach was hurting first you tried a jalusal digestion it didn't go it's hurting even more then you ran to the doctor and the doctor said now surgery now thank god you came on time otherwise your appendix would have burst and then i would have had to open you up so much more to clean up the mess and then when you take something your stomach is hurting and then you realize i think my intestines have rotten away i got ulcers right you need to realize pain is a good thing but when it comes to life sadly we do not deal with pain that way when it comes to physical sickness we are careful about pain and we deal with the sickness but when it comes to life people do not deal with pain that way instead they get obsessed with the pain they attend seminars on pain publish thesis and letters on pain get on endless conversations about their pain they do everything except go to the heavenly physician with their sickness that is why still you are in pain so there is a physician who said i will deal with your sickness not with your pain your pain will go away only when the sickness is dealt with right and sometimes the pain may increase for a season ask anybody who has had an operation oh this sister charita just came out of an operation right before that there was pain then during the operation there was intense pain but now you will see the pain is subsiding with each day and one day the pain will be gone so before healing can come there will be an increase of pain and then it will subside and then health will be restored but god says do you want to come under my scalpel do you want to come under my sword i will cut you through deal with your sickness and you will come out of your pain and those who came with their pain to jesus he dealt with them he dealt with their pain he made them whole and he sent them those who refused to become whole they continued back and their pains came back the pains came back hannah's pain was real and she had an adversary who mocked her day and night and she twisted the knife no not only put the knife in also twisted the knife scripture says right there in the house of the lord when they went to worship also she was mocking her adversary and does that describe anyone here if you are truly a child of god verse 6 will describe you what does it say and a rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable that's the whole idea of the adversary you see there are men and women who are your adversaries but behind that there is an adversary who uses them to provoke you to make you miserable why when you become miserable you will take your eyes of god 
When you become miserable, they take your eyes of God. But you, as a child of God, you are forgetting something. Scripture doesn't say there, Hannah was barren. Scripture doesn't say any child of God in your workplace, in your home, wherever you are, if you have failed or you look you are a failure, it doesn't say you are barren. It only says her womb was closed by God. It doesn't say she was barren. There's a difference being barren and there's a difference being the womb closed by God for a season. And that's what God is trying to tell you. In any sphere in your life, if you feel you are a failure, and God is saying you have an adversary who is mocking you day and night, it's because I have closed your womb. I have closed your womb for a purpose. I have closed your womb. It is the Lord who has held back your breakthrough. Can you say with me, there is a reason for my delay? There is a reason for my delay? There is a reason. The Pelinas can give any, birth, any number of breakthroughs. Because the breakthroughs mean nothing in the kingdom of God. But the Hannas have to wait. If you are a child of God, you have to wait. Because God is doing a greater work than your breakthrough. And that's what scripture is saying. Everybody is eating and drinking. Verse 8. That she did not eat. Verse 7. Did you see the last part? Hanna did not eat. Alkanah, her husband said to Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And look at verse 9. So Anna arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. It's good to eat and drink. It's good. But if that is all that you do, then you have fallen on the side of Penina. What did Hannah do? Earlier few months back we preached on sitting down. God says there are times when you need to stand up. When the others are seated, you stand up. Because why are the others seated? They are not seated, rested in the Lord. They are seated because everything seems to be going for them. And he says that's the time you need to stand up and go to the Lord. And Hannah stood up and she went to Shiloh. She went alone and she went to God. Don't worry about your enemy. Don't worry about the world. But if you know God has got a purpose in your life, that is the moment to stand up and separate yourself from the rest of the crowd. Then only your breakthrough will come. And not only that, you need to go and pour your heart before God. What does it say? She was in the bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Remember two things here. One, if you are a child of God, you are not barren. God has only closed your womb because he is doing a great work in the womb of your soul. He is preparing your soul, the womb of your soul to bring forth something which will be at all, not at all like Penina's children. He is doing a big work over there so that when you finally receive your breakthrough, you finally conceive the fruit of your womb will match the fruit of the spirit. Penina's children never match the fruit of the spirit. Second thing, the enemy or adversary will try to provoke you like Penina, that you may lose focus. You will either take your eyes of God and focus on yourself, or you will focus on Penina. That's how most people focus. When your breakthrough isn't coming and going through a lot of pain and anguish, you will start focusing inside. Or you will focus at your enemy. God says, Hannah didn't do either. If you are busy responding to the provocations of the adversaries in your life, the reason is you will not be able to separate yourself and pray. Simple question. You need to answer to yourself. If you are not able to pray in the midst of your problem, it's because your eyes are on your enemy. You are busy responding to your adversary. If your eyes are upon God, you will always pray. If you are not able to really seriously pray in the midst of your problem, really pray, really, I'm not talking about the daily prayers, I'm talking about praying like this in the midst of your problem. It's because your eyes are either upon yourself, your problem, or your eyes are upon your enemy. If you read carefully over there, you will see the third lesson, that the penance of this world have been put there in your life by God to drive you to Him. Penina has been put there, right there by God to bring Hannah to him. If there was no Penina, 
there would be no Hanna in the Bible. And God says, do we respond as Hanna? In that entire first chapter, Hanna refuses to address Penina. There is no word of Penina in her prayer or in her anguish. She doesn't even exchange words or anger or even discuss Penina with her husband. Did you see that? Nothing is there. She doesn't discuss Penina with her husband. In her prayer before God, nothing of Penina is there at all. She didn't avoid her either. Go back. Go back early. Go back further. The man, yes. Go further up. This man went up from his early halls, okay? And whenever, whenever Elkanah made, you come down further. And how did they go? Come further down? Yeah. So it was, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, she provoked her. Did you see that? Sometimes what happens is that when we have adversaries, we try to avoid them. Hannah didn't do that either. She went every year with Penina to Shiloh. She didn't say, okay, you go with her, I am not coming. It's either her or me. Either I come with you or she goes with you. I am staying home. Meaning, if you, if you feel you have adversaries in your close circle, in your workplace, in your home, in your church, I hope there aren't, but if you have, don't try to avoid them. You can't avoid them. God has placed you right there. There is no breaking of fellowship within the body, within a home. And Nina decided, no, Hannah decided, I'm going to the house of the Lord, even if Penna is there or not there, I'm going. And I will go with her if she is there. Instead, what did she do? She did not run to her husband or confront Penina. Instead, verse 10 says she went to God. Your adversary will always try to provoke you through people. What does God say? Don't respond. Isaiah chapter 36 and verse 21. Learn the lessons. This will help you because we have a lot of people going through pain everywhere who listens. And they held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was, do not answer him. Why? Who is this one? This is the enemy that has surrounded Israel and is challenging the people and mocking the people. And the king told, keep your mouth shut, don't answer him. Keep your mouth shut, God will answer him. You don't answer. Keep your mouth shut. God is telling us, don't answer your adversary. Don't discuss your adversary. Don't discuss that at all. Keep your mouth shut. Why? Because God will answer. It's a God who will answer. It's a God who answers. Do not answer your adversary. I'm not talking about the enemy. We need to talk to him. He said, back off. I'm talking about the flesh and blood through which the enemy attacks us. Don't respond to them. Scripture says, don't. And this is so difficult for the flesh. Because scripture says, this went on for year after year after year. There is no solution in sight. Yes, Hanna went to Shiloh year after year. Most people would quit. Either they quit their jobs, they change location, they change places, they change churches, they change their marriages. They do. I can't live with this man anymore. I'm quitting. I, had, I can't live with this woman anymore. I'm quitting. God says, don't. I had enough. But Penina was put there by God so that Hanna would rise up to higher ground with God. You may think you are barren, but God says, I closed your womb and I put a penina in your life so that you would come to me. The blessing that is delayed, the promotion that never seems to come, the husband that has left you or the spouse who left you is designed by God to take you to higher ground with him. Can you say an amen to that? If you are honest, you will know that many of you wouldn't be sitting here in the house of God if you hadn't gone through that pain. You are having a good time in the world. You didn't give a second thought for God. You are just a casual appearance on a Sunday to God and you thought you had done your due. You went back and was having a good time in the world because I was that. Then the pain had to come. When the pain came, thank God, God directed your steps in the right direction. Come to me. Come to me. He said, come to me. And Penina did never went. She went to Shiloh and she provoked her adversary. Hannah went to God and worshipped God. So you can be in the same house of God while one is worshipping, the other may be mocking. And God sees and God sees. 
Penina brought out the best in Hannah. And God is asking us, what is the adversary doing to you? Sometimes the adversary usually brings out the worst in flesh. But God is saying, is your adversary bringing out the best in you? Or is it bringing the worst in you? Verse 10, do you pour yourselves before God? Or do you pour out your bitterness at man? What does it say? She was in bitterness of soul. And what did she do? She went and vomited it all before men? No, it says she poured it before God. It's a good place to pour your bitterness. Don't pour your bitterness before other people. Because they will also become bitter then. Pour your bitterness before God. And the scripture says she went and poured it before God. And when you pour it before God, how do you do that? Psalm 25, David says how he did it. We pray like that, we sing that song, but what do we say? Unto you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you, let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. He did not run anywhere else. He said, unto you, O Lord, I am lifting, I am bitter in my soul. My enemies are triumphing over me. And I am telling you, O Lord. So he is saying, why is that happening to me? Show me your ways. Teach me your ways, O God. I'm sure, Lord, I am not barren. You have closed my womb for a season. I'm not barren. I'm very sure. Show me your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. And lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Remember, O oh Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness. For they are from all old. What is God? He reminding God of. This is what you are. You are a merciful God. You are a loving, kind God. And from old, that is what I have heard about you. And look at verse 7. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me. Do we go before God that way? Honestly, when we go before God, do we go? How do we approach God? Because today with this new final gospel surround, prayer has changed. But do we really go, Lord, please remember me according to your mercy, not according to my sins. Don't remember me according to my sins, instead remember me according to your mercy. Do we come to God when we are praying that way? Because God is able to see through, like the, like the song which we sang today, He cuts through all the outward things into your heart and He knows how we are coming to Him. Outwardly we may all look same in the house of God, but in the heart God knows those who are weeping and crying over their sins. And they tell God, Lord, please don't remember me according to your, according to my iniquity, according to my sin. Please remember me according to your mercy. And God says, that's the kind of person I'm looking at. Because everyone here sitting here, everyone in the world, everyone who hears this message sins. But few cry over their sins. Most justify, others blame. Others or circumstances. But Hannah is not doing any of this. She is pouring her soul before God. There is no mention of any adversary in her prayers. Now there is a caution, warning in scripture about this, about our heart's attitude. Because you cannot separate attitude from salvation. Did you know that? Romans 8, 9. Because this is a, this we need to be cautious about when we want our prayers to be answered. You cannot separate attitude from. For you are not in the flesh, but in the. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. The word Greek there in the last part, spirit over here, this spirit. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, that spirit means attitude. If you do not have the attitude of Christ, that means you are not his. That's why we have to be very careful about how am I going to God? Am I going to God? Because it is true, I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. But other than that, I don't have anything. You look at Paul, he will always say, this is what I am. This is how I approach God. Worst of sinners, chief of sinners, least of apostles. This is what I am. But we look and say, wow, what a man. But he knows none of those have any meaning what he has achieved. Everything is based on God's mercy. According to your mercy, O God, remember me. Scripture says, if you do not have the attitude of Christ, you are not of His. And what does the Bible say? Do we have that attitude? Do we have that attitude? Scripture is asking us. Do we have that attitude? Philippians 2.5 
What does scripture tell us? Five. Have this. Philippians 2, 5 will tell us, have this mind or attitude of Christ Jesus. Do we have this? Let this mind, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is what is being asked. And Hannah is approaching God with that attitude. She's not coming based on anything else. She's coming to God based on the attitudes. Lord, this is what I am. My problem is not with my adversary. My problem is not with my circumstances. I am crying out to you because you are the only one who can hear me. And God says, when I am being provoked by my enemies, when they are picking up stones to kill me, he says, I slipped away quietly. He says, do you? He says, I slipped away quietly. You know what the disciples did? Or do we react like Jesus' own disciples? They were walking with Jesus. Luke chapter 9 verses 51 to 55. They were walking with Jesus. And they had to go to Samaria. And in Samaria they had opposition. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for a journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? You never probably read this. You need to understand, this is a religious dispute. The Samaritan woman explained, he said, you Jews say that you need to worship in Jerusalem, but our father says we need to worship at this mountain. To her, Jesus said, I am telling you, you will be neither worshipping in Jerusalem or on this mountain. A time is coming when people shall worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit is with the attitude of Christ and in truth. So, Jesus and his entourage was coming and Samaria was supposed to be prepared for him. But when they heard he was not going to worship at the mountain, but instead going to Jerusalem, they said, we don't want you here. Now, God is saying that in case somebody comes into our church or into our life, who doesn't worship God the way we do? I'm talking about Christians. Do we say that you're not welcome here? We need to be very careful. We preach the truth, but we acknowledge and welcome everybody. We don't acknowledge sin. We don't acknowledge rebellion, but we acknowledge people. Everybody may be not like us. I encourage people, lift up your hands, worship and all. But what if somebody doesn't lift up? Do we go and remind him, brother, you are not worshipping the way we are used to? Some people pray. They can pray well because they have a lifestyle of praying. Some people can't. So therefore we go and remind them, brother, you need to learn how to pray. How many of you have heard Jesus pray? Did he shout? Did he scream? Did he jump, did he jump up and down? He didn't. Others may do that. But he just had to speak. Be still. Maybe people in within the fellowship who may not do things the way we do it. But does that become a reason to bring fire down from heaven? And these are people who walked with Jesus. No. See, the whole thing is that you and I need to realize, I can't change anybody. Including my spouse or my children, I can't change anybody. I can tell them the truth and leave it to God to work it in their lives. You can't change anybody. And some of you are facing struggles in your homes because you are trying to change somebody by force. Don't do it. Only God can do it. And if they do it because you force them, it's never real. It will not last. It's only God who can change. It's only God who can change people. We cannot change people. So the best thing is to do, you just be there, imitate Christ in your homes and let God be God and allow people that space to be what they want to be and pray and pray and God will change the adversaries in your life if they want to be changed but that's God's call it's not your or my call and that's why scripture says what did Jesus do? no next verse 55 what did Jesus do? he turned and he rebuked them he says, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. He, says, he rebuked them. He says, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. You, you walked with me around for so long, almost three and a half years, he's still talking like the devil. He rebuked them. He says, be careful. 
So that's basically what we want. Complain, complain, complain. Basically, deep inside, we wouldn't mind if some fire fell on our adversaries. God says, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. Did you come to me and pour out your soul? Did you come and cry? I would have dealt with your situation. Did you really pour out your soul before me and then I would have told you, my dear one, see, I've got a great purpose and a plan for you. This is what is coming. This is what is coming. This is what is coming. And you, you, you need to be ready because Penina can give any number of ordinary births, ordinary children, but your womb is being prepared for something big. So you need to be prepared for that. Don't you understand? Should have got the answer. But we don't do that. Instead, we are busy fighting adversaries. The second thing we need to realize when we go before God, God says in Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for? Mm. Be anxious for nothing. What is God is saying? Do not let your troubles cause you anxiety. Bitterness of soul, crying out before the Lord, praying, weeping, crying, is not the same as anxiety. Anxiety is something else. God says, let not our troubles cause us anxiety. It should instead lead us to Christ. Anxious people seldom pray. Do you know that? Anxious people seldom pray. They are so busy, anxious, they have no time to pray. And God says, in your anxiety, that's what will happen to you. Be anxious for nothing. Matthew 6, verse 31 to 33. Matthew 6, verse 31 to 33. He says, stop being anxious. Stop worrying about these things. What does he say? Therefore, do not be anxious. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? And if you are anxious about the basic things of life, what are you? Gentile. You are a Gentile. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. These are the things the Gentiles seek. And be honest and say, is that what you are worrying about? My future, will I have a home? Will I be able to afford to buy an apartment? Will I get a good job? Will I get a good husband? Will I get a good wife? How are my children going to turn out to be? Are you anxious? He says, the pagans also worry about all these things. They are no better than a Gentile. Because he says, your father. He doesn't say God. He says, your father. Your father. You know what is a beautiful illustration which the Lord gave me this morning. This morning. Something from scripture. He told me, when I comb my hair, he says, when that hair fell, he said, you didn't notice. I did. He says, I have written in scripture, not even a hair from your head falls without your father in heaven knowing. Why are you anxious about many things? Why are you anxious about many things? And God says, be anxious for nothing. He's not saying not to pray. He says, don't be anxious. Why are you anxious? When you become anxious, you take God off the throne and you put yourself over there and you find God's throne is too hot for you. And that's why you become anxious. He says, let God sit in his throne and then it is natural to be concerned about drought. Right? When nothing is happening in your life, when there is barrenness or the womb is closed, no promotion, nothing is happening. It is natural to be concerned about the drought. But Hannah was not even concerned just about the drought. She was also concerned about the crop. You didn't get it. Look at verse 11. Look at her prayer. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall come upon his head. Are you understand? Now she is facing a drought in her life and she is dealing with the Lord. Lord, you deal with my drought. I have no child. And she's not satisfied with that. When the crop comes from that barren ground, O oh Lord, I'm now concerned about the crop. I believe that you will give me a child, but let that child belong to you all the days of your life. Two things. He shall be a Levite. Though he's from Ephraim, he shall be a Levite and he shall be a Nazarite. Not only will he serve you, he shall be separated unto you all the days of his life. And mamas and dada sitting here, honestly, how many of you have prayed for a crop like that. 
seriously prayed for a crop like that. Lord, I want a child. But you give me a child, I give the child back over to you. It's not saying with the mouth. It's not saying with the mouth. All of us say that with the mouth. But Anna practiced that in her life to see that he followed God. That's what God is asking. Do we? Because if the Lord gives you your breakthrough, gives you your promotion, the salary hike you are looking for, or the husband you are looking, praying for, or the wife you are praying for, will you take that and put it on the altar is what God is asking you today. There are many, many ladies who ask for a husband, Lord, 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 give me a husband, give me a godly husband, give me a godly husband. When he gives you a godly husband, they won't allow them to worship God. You are all the time praying, you are all the time go for meetings, why don't you spend time with me? But didn't you ask for a godly husband, meaning that husband belongs to God? You pray for godly wives. Lord, give me a godly wife, give me a godly wife. She comes, she's always busy praying and interceding for others. You have no time for me now. <coughs> Isn't that what really happens? <coughs> if you check back in history, those who have done surveys, you will see that men and women were faithful when their salaries were very low in tithing. And when God asked them, they asked God and cried for a breakthrough and prosperity and blessings and when that it went up, they were not faithful in their tithing. Because it was easy to give 100 rupees out of 10,000. It is very difficult to give 10,000 out of a lakh. Yet forgetting that what he had left in your pocket was 90,000 when you had earlier only 9,000. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. That's not what Hannah is saying. Hannah is saying, Lord, you give me, I give it back to you. I give it back to you. Because, Lord, if I live with this man in this house and end, end my life as a barren woman, I have missed out your purpose in my life. What was my purpose? What was my purpose? She is not saying, give me also five sons like Penina. She said, Lord, fulfill your purpose, your destiny in me. Otherwise, what's the use of me being born? It's not about my adversary. Otherwise, she would have turned at the adversary and said, Lord, deal with her. Let three of her children die. Then she will know my pain. It's not got to do with the mocking of the adversary. It's not what the society is talking about. It's a question of, Lord, if I was born, there is a purpose. Am I fulfilling purpose or not? Am I fulfilling purpose or not? And that's what she is asking. And that's what she is saying. A double fold. He will serve you. No razor will touch his head. He will be a Levite and he will be a Nazarite. Lord, I want my son, my daughter to become a doctor or Lord, MBBS, MD and all the degrees associated with that. Okay. And then when the Lord calls him to go out to the remote area in the missions with 2000 rupees salary and saying in a hut, will you send him? Send him? No, only global hospital. Very close to me so that I'm, when I am sick and all, he should take care of me. Oh, that's why you want a doctor in the family. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought in your greatness you were coming to me and telling, Lord, make my son a doctor so that he can go to the missions. Because one of the best professions to open missions is a doctor. Everybody welcomes him. Any other way to preach the gospel is very difficult. But if go has a doctor into any close community, they welcome him. But do we as Christian fathers and mothers release our children onto the altar so that God can use them? Hannah did. Hannah did. And that's what God is asking us. Where do we? Where do we stand? Where are we? He is asking. Then we come back to Philippines and look at another point of Hannah's prayer. Hannah is praying, she is crying, she is weeping. It's called supplication in the Bible. Come to verse 6 of Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and by supplication. And supplication is what we see in Hebrews 5 about Jesus with Christ that couldn't be uttered. Here is she pouring out her heart before God is supplication. And then with, with what? Uh -huh. Do we all say, do we all pray to God with thanksgiving? Yes, Lord, haven't you heard me, Pastor? Whenever I say, I say, thank you, Lord, thank you for blessing me, blessing my wife, blessing my cat, blessing my dog. You don't know, always thanksgiving. You know what thanksgiving is, really? Vijay works for me. Imagine Vijay works for me. At the end of the month, I give him his paycheck. What does he tell me? Thank you, Pastor. 
Did he say thank you? He said thank you. Vijay is in poverty. He's not working for me. He is in poverty. And he needs help badly. I give him a thousand rupees. Now he said thank you. Is there a difference between the first thank you and second thank you? Yes. Now it is not one and two. Third case. He is my enemy. All his life he has ganged up with my enemies and mocked him from the day he was born. Always plotted to bring me down. And one day he is in terrible need. He's hit the pits. He comes to me and I bless him with my life. And he says thank you. The third is called thanksgiving. Is thanksgiving. That's why we need to look at the prayers of the saints in the Bible. They are coming to God and say, Lord, this is what I was. This is what I deserve from you. This is what you did for me with prayer and with thanksgiving. But when we thank God, usually thanking is connected with the blessings we receive. Blessings we receive. We say, Lord, thank you for the promotion. Thank you for the child. Thank you. It's all God. But what about real thanksgiving? Or the real thanksgiving. This is what I was. This is what I was. And God is saying, do you come to me with thanksgiving? Do you really come to me with thanksgiving? It's only in scene 3 we will understand. Actually when I stand before God, this is what I am. I was his enemy. Enemy of God. Against God all my life. Even now most of the things which we do are against God. And yet he doesn't remember me or you according to our iniquities or sin. He remembers us according to his mercies. Isn't that true? Is there anybody who didn't sin today? Let's forget to yesterday. Sin today? I did. Yes, does he remember us according to our our sin? Or does he remember us according to his mercies? That's when we come to God with thanksgiving. You look at, look at Hannah's petition. She's teaching us about prayer. She's no complaint, nothing at all. No complaint. Lord, how could you do this to and don't, do, don't you know what kind of a good lady I am? Haven't I been faithful? Haven't I been coming to Shiloh year after year? Absolutely nothing. In a brokenness of soul, she's asking, Lord, am I missing my purpose? Am I missing my destiny? Lord, if you answer my prayer, then I also pray that I will fulfill purpose in that answered prayer. I will give the son back to you. There's no point in having a son who doesn't fulfill your purpose. I want a son who will fulfill your purpose. And when God sees those tears and those prayers with thanksgiving, scripture says in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8, that is when we will have real boldness to come to the throne room of grace. And what happens? Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp. And what else did they have? A golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. What is it called? A bowl of incense. It's called a bowl of incense. Now you know where the incense was? Oh, you came from the outer courts. You cleansed yourself and came to the outer courts. You entered into the most holy place. Oh, table of shoe bread. the, The lamb. And then just before the most holy place is the incense. And who took the incense up before the Lord? The high priest took up the incense before the Lord and offered it to God. When with thanksgiving, without being anxious, with prayer and supplication, when the saints pour out their hearts before God, Jesus the high priest in the throne of grace lifts up a praise to the Father and offers it as a sweet smelling aroma to God. That's what is happening in heaven. And you ask ourselves, how much of such prayers are actually rising? For him to offer it to the Father. It's a litany of complaints. Or a litany of requests connected with things which has got nothing to do with God, his kingdom or his purpose. And that's what God is asking. Third year he is asking church, which way are you going to redirect, shape your life and shape the church? Because our prayers, if they are poured before God, collected by the angels, the high priest Jesus takes them before God. Then something is happening. The womb of your character is maturing. And it is time now to open it. Now it is time to open your womb. The womb which God has closed is ready because the nature of Christ has been formed within you. Then it doesn't matter who the pastor is. He can be an absolutely crooked fellow like Eli, but through his mouth God will speak. It's irrelevant who is ministering then. 
Because your prayer has been poured before God. Anybody can give you the answer. And Eli says, let God answer the cry of your heart. Let God answer the cry of your heart. And what happened? Who came forth? Samuel came forth. And God is telling many people today, your Samuel is, your breakthrough is greater than all the children of Penina put together. Maybe Penina got her breakthrough 20 years earlier. Maybe the adversaries you face every day in your workplace, in your home, whoever have got their breakthrough years back. But when your breakthrough comes, their breakthroughs will be worth nothing. Your breakthrough is from God. But your breakthrough will come only when you do and deal with it God's way. Otherwise, it will, it will, the womb will remain closed. Because your breakthrough is connected with His kingdom. You know what? Penina entered history as a footnote. Hannah made it into God's headlines. That's the truth. If you look back after chapter 1, there is no record in the Bible of either Penina or her children. There is no record of Penina or her children. Because you need to look into what, why she had to travail in the spirit. Because First Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 will tell you the state of Israel. What does it say? And the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And there was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, when Eli was lying down in his place, when his eyes had begun to grow so dim, he could not see. And verse 3, And before the Lamb of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Did you get it? There is no revelation. There is no word of God. The light is symbolic. It's not just talking about the Lamb that is there. The light of God in that nation is almost dying out. A little Samuel stands up and hears the voice of God. That's why Hannah had to travel. That's why her womb was closed. Because she was going to produce something which would impact the nation and the world forever. And God says, that's exactly why I have closed your womb up. I'm not talking about your physical womb. I'm talking about your situations. Because you need to travel. Because your breakthrough will change the situation for many. For them it's a promotion. What their breakthrough is. But for you it will be life. You will be a carrier of God's life. And he says, are you willing to be that? Because in the Old Testament, Samuel is only second to Moses. Moses closed the old order and established a new. Samuel closed an old order and established a new. He terminated judgeship and introduced kingship. Priesthood, God speaking through the priesthood almost finished with Samuel and the office of prophet took over from Samuel. He anointed two kings. And do you see that if Penina had not provoked Hannah, she would have probably been happy with the love of her husband. She would have become complacent. Okay, my husband loves me. I'm okay, I'm fine. It's okay. After all, he gives me a double portion. I will adopt another child. That's okay with me. There would have been no Samuel. There would have been no Samuel. What if Pharaoh hadn't ill-treated the Israelites? You read in the book of Exodus, Oh, Pharaoh ill-treated the Israelites, ill-treated the Israelites, appointed Tasmal. What if he hadn't done? They all would have settled in Goshen thinking, this is God's purpose for us. There would have been no Israel, no nation, no Messiah. God would have to work out his whole plan all over again. But the Pharaoh had to rise, who ill-treated. An adversary had to rise for Israel to be born. What if the gates of Jerusalem had not been born, burned down? Nehemiah would have been still pouring wine into the emperor's cup. What changed his mind? He heard the gates of Israel, Jerusalem had been burned down. That was the breaking point for Nehemiah. After that he couldn't sleep. The gates of Jerusalem has been burned down. We look at the gates of Jerusalem being burned down as a tragedy. God says, no, that is a good thing because I raised a man who started praying and interceded because the gates was burned down. Then he got on his knees and he started praying. He started crying out to the Lord. He got favor with the king and the remnant came back to Jerusalem and built it all up. 
what if in the lake of Gennesareth, when Peter flung out his net, it was full of catch? He would have been still fishing instead of becoming a fisher of man. Did he get the call of God on his life? Because that day he failed. His adversity itself became the reason why God came into his life. So we all ask these personal questions. What if your husband hadn't left you? What if your boss hadn't been nasty? What if your children hadn't been rebellious? What if, what if, what if, each one of us knows what if. And we know the fact, if you are sitting in this church, especially where the message is so long, and you need perseverance and patience to sit for one hour, twenty minutes of the word, it's because you went through your pain. Otherwise you will find comfortable places. There are many comfortable places, twenty minutes over and done. But you are here, It was brought, you were brought here because of the pain. So God is asking us today, are you delaying the birth of Samuel in your life? Not barren. God says, I just closed your womb. Are you focusing on Penina? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 11 and 12, and 58 and 9. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contended with you, those who rage, war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. You are more worried about Peninas in your life, Hana, Hana wasn't. And God is asking us, are you more worried? What does Isaiah 50 verse 8 and 9 say? 55 0 verse 8 and 9. It says the same thing. He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. So why are you worried about your adversary? Why are you worried about your adversary? And you know what? In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9, Paul says the secret. He gives us the secret. He says, For a great and effective door has opened to me. And there are many adversaries. Ah, there are many adversaries. But in the middle of those great and big adversaries, a great and big door was opened. If those adversaries hadn't been there, the door would have been a very small door. Because the adversary is many, God he says, a great and big door was opened for me. So you need to start looking at your adversity and your adversaries differently. And for that, the only way out, God says, is if you come to me like Hannah with the brokenness, with supplication, with prayer, with thanksgiving and without being anxious. Because why? Because there is a tremendous line in the Bible which says, the God who inhabits eternity also inhabits in a broken and a contrite spirit. Only two places he is found. One is in eternity, he inhabits eternity, he also is found in a broken and a contrite spirit. You know that? That's Hannah. And that's why God was found in her. But this one will I look on whom he is poor and of a contrite spirit. And who trembles at my? Look at verse 1. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? For all these things my hand has made. And all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. And another place he will say he inhabits eternity. He also dwells in the heart of who is broken and contrite. And broken and contrite doesn't mean you walk like this. I'm not talking about that. It's talking about your eyes are always focused on God and his word. Jesus did not walk stooping like, I am so sorry, miserable. He walked straight. But he only spoke the word. And when he spoke the word, people got angry with him. Then they wanted to stone him. But he says, no, I will not lift any experience, anything that I am going through above the word of God. Because why? Because my father has exalted the word above the heavens. I will stand or fall by the word. Amen. Shall we also stand now for the word and not fall? Father, we come to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. You are a good God. 
A God who created everything. A God who says in his word that I measure the universe with the span of my hands. As east, east, west. As east to west, north to south. From the rising of the sun to the setting down of the same, your says, the whole of creation declares your glory, your name. Yet you choose to dwell in the heart of those who are contrite and broken, who do not justify their sins before you, who comes to you every day knowing that, O oh Lord, remember me according to your mercies and not according to my iniquities. I have no justification when I stand before you, God, other than through the blood of your Son. I have no adversaries of God because of Father. You had no adversaries on earth. Even with those who contented you, if you forgave them on the cross and you died for them, O oh God. The very Pharisees whom you rebuked, you loved them enough to die for them. And you are telling us this morning, you don't have adversaries other than the one in the spiritual realm. The liar, the father of all lies. The one who comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. We do not fight flesh and blood. He says... Your womb is only closed. You are not barren. It's closed for a season. Because if you believe and trust in me, you are going to give birth to something big. Which will be always, always be their part of God's history. It was in travailing that Isaac was born. It was in travailing that Moses was born. It was in travailing that Samuel was born. Every act of God in the Bible came through travail and tears. And God is saying, don't look for the easy way out. Because I'm preparing your womb. I'm preparing a great, great breakthrough for you. But are you willing to be like Hannah and say, Lord, what you give me, I give it back to you. On the altar, it's wholly yours to serve you. And to serve you in a manner that is worthy of you. He will not be just a Levite. He will also be a Nazarite. So Father, I am praying, O God, from within this church will arise people. Who will take everything they receive from you. And give it back to you, O God. In a manner that glorifies your name. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We are into our third year, O God. And I believe, O God, you are speaking to us. You spoke to your servant last week. You're speaking to us even this morning ago that you have great plans for your children. That for many of them, their breakthroughs are in here because they themselves have shut their wombs. It's not you. You've been waiting, waiting, waiting for them to break before you. To humble themselves before you. To be contrite, to be broken. And then you would birth something great in their life, God. So that their offices their universities, their schools, their colleges, wherever they are, would be impacted by what they bring forth. Because it would be not of Elkanah and Penina, it would be of you and you alone. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. Thank you. We give you all the glory, Master. Once again, I plead the blood of Jesus over your children, here and everywhere else. Touch them, O oh God. Let the blood deliver. Let the blood heal. Let the blood protect. Let the blood cover. Let the blood rise up against that adversary of our souls. He is defeated. Let no one give place to the enemy in their souls of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We praise you. We worship you, God. We give you all the glory. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us. Amen. For all our sermons and Bible study messages, please visit us online at www.gracetabernaclehype.org I repeat, www.gracetabernaclehype.org